This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for November 30th, 2022. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Eric and Lindsay, we've now been talking about the COVID-19 outbreak for more than two and a half years, and unfortunately, the disease is still with us. But today, I thought that we should talk about some of the other outbreaks that are going on right now, some of which are much more pressing problems for the areas in which they're occurring. Let's start with two respiratory viral diseases that, along with COVID-19, are a problem here in the United States, influenza and respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. So what's the situation right now with those two outbreaks? Steve, we discussed a bit about these two infections last week. Let's start with RSV. This is a common seasonal virus that generally causes mild infections. However, some groups are highly susceptible and can develop serious infections. These include infants, particularly premature infants, and the elderly. Unfortunately, while there are several candidates in clinical trials, there is not yet a vaccine available for RSV. So far, the clinical trials look encouraging, at least for older adults, but there's nothing available yet. Fortunately, it does look like the incidence of RSV might be starting to fall in the U.S., though it's still a little early to tell. However, this is just the start of the flu season, and the incidence is rising dramatically right now. Thus far, there are no viral surprises. The two circulating strains of influenza A, an H1N1 and an H3N2, are pretty good matches to the antigens included in the current vaccine. Although the vaccine contains two influenza B antigens, we haven't seen the Yamagata strain, and there's some evidence that it might be going extinct. There is, however, a reasonably well-matched Victoria strain antigen. So that's the good news. The bad is that the rates of influenza vaccination are lower than they've been in the recent past. So even though we have a vaccine that's likely to be effective this year, we have a frustratingly low number of people getting vaccinated, and the rates of influenza are likely to continue to rise for a while. So Eric and Steve, I think these two respiratory viruses raise interesting parallels with what we've faced with SARS-CoV-2 or COVID over the last three years. As noted, they're respiratory viruses, so the mode of transmission is similar. There also is a mild to posse symptomatic expression facilitating transmission and the importance of being able to diagnose early, particularly for influenza, where one can treat, especially those who are at higher risk, is important. And I think we've learned with COVID, the ability to diagnose testing is critically important to know who's infected and therefore may be contagious. And that our countermeasures, such as vaccines for flu, as you raised, Eric, are better at preventing severe illness than mild or asymptomatic illness, if one can extend that asymptomatic concept to these respiratory viruses, which I think is probably true, although some debate this issue. And then the ability to develop better vaccines. You know, the flu vaccine, as you note, Eric, is either trivalent or quadrivalent, standard dose or high dose, so there are different variables associated with it. And then there are adjuvanted and other forms of the flu vaccine. But we have increasing access to novel technology to potentially improve how the flu vaccine is developed to better match and to also be able to deliver more potently. And I think these are things which are similar discussion elements that we've had over the last three years with SARS-CoV-2. I think RSV raises an important point that you point out, Eric, which is our countermeasures for RSV are actually quite limited. We do have a monoclonal that can be useful in our premature infants to prevent RSV, and that actually helped pave the road for monoclonal antibody development that we used widely in our response to COVID. Also, the understanding of the spike associated with RSV and being able to stabilize the prefusion form allowed design and rapid development of the spike antigens that we use in our COVID vaccines. Yet, we don't have a vaccine for RSV, although some are in advanced development, despite decades of effort. And I think this speaks to the issue of focus and resources to solve problems. And I do hope that one of the things we learn from COVID is that if we set our scientific mind to it, we can solve the problems of vaccine development and countermeasure development for very important pathogens. 
And I look forward to the cross-fertilization of technologies and scientific developments to be able to better respond to these pathogens, which, as you point out, Steve, RSV and influenza are infecting tens of millions and will do so over the next few months with a substantial amount of morbidity. So I think there are a lot of parallels here and much for us to learn. Just to pick up on your discussion of RSV vaccines, Lindsay, I think that one of the huge challenges in the development of these vaccines is who to target. It's become increasingly clear that older individuals are at risk for serious RSV infection, something that was somewhat overlooked. That does make vaccine development a little more tractable because it's so much more difficult to protect newborns who are the other very high risk group for this pathogen. Another disease we've discussed a number of times is monkeypox, or mpox, as the World Health Organization has recently renamed it. So what's the current status of that outbreak? The current outbreak is certainly unusual. Monkeypox has largely been transmitted in Africa in the past, where it's a zoonotic disease transmitted among rodents. There has been very little human-to-human transmission in the past. However, during the current outbreak, transmission has largely occurred through very close, largely sexual contact. It's unclear why this change has occurred, in part because it's difficult to study these orthopox viruses, viruses which have enormous genomes and are biohazardous. There have been two big questions surrounding the treatment and prevention of mpox. All of our therapies and vaccines were designed for smallpox. The viruses are clearly closely related, and it seems likely that similar strategies should work for both. But even for smallpox, there's been little human testing of many interventions for efficacy. Because smallpox is gone, all current efficacy studies have been performed in animal models. Thus, we don't know how well these interventions actually work. And because there's a good likelihood that there's at least some efficacy of both drugs and vaccines, there really isn't equipoise to do a placebo-controlled study. So it's not clear that we will ever have evidence beyond observational studies that help us understand how well the strategies we're currently employing for mpox are working. Importantly, however, the fact that most infections have been seen among men who have sex with men has allowed targeted social interventions that have been highly effective. This community has a history of being very conscious and engaged in healthcare messaging, and it's mobilized quite well. This probably is the largest contributor to the fact that the number of cases in the U.S. and elsewhere has fallen considerably and is continuing to decline. So, Eric, I'd like to continue to make comparisons with the outbreaks that you're highlighting And what we've faced in the last three years with SARS-CoV-2. And though monkeypox is newly introduced into the U.S., or not quite newly introduced, we saw 20 years ago in the outbreak in prairie dogs with a few spillover infections. But for the most part, we have a naive population globally. However, as you point out, it's an orthopox virus and likely has similarities to smallpox, which we as a community were able to successfully eradicate more than 40 years ago. And key elements of smallpox, which I think are tractable to monkeypox and quite different and tractable to mpox, which are quite different from respiratory viruses, are the fact that Most cases, if not all cases, have clinical symptomatology, so there probably is not an asymptomatic reservoir of transmission, although not fully investigated for mpox, understood for smallpox. It largely is a physical contact, not a respiratory spread, and that we have countermeasures such as other orthopox vaccines that have a high likelihood of being effective against monkeypox given the nature of the animal models and the testing that was previously done, leveraging the animal world, as you point out. And lastly, the issue of reservoirs, which I think will be important and I alluded to earlier. If MPOX is able to establish a zoonotic reservoir, then we'll have a different challenge. However, as mentioned, this did not occur with the introduction 20 years ago in the U.S., and so hopefully will not occur. Therefore, the focus on treating and preventing infection in those at risk will then allow us to eradicate this orthopox virus from outside of endemic areas. We've also talked recently about the Ebola outbreak in Uganda. Where do things stand with that? Well, any outbreak of Ebola is frightening, of course. 
particularly when it reaches a large city like Kampala. And the current outbreak has an additional problem. It's being caused by the Sudan Ebola virus, which is antigenically distinct from Zaire Ebola virus, the virus that has caused many of the recent outbreaks. That means that the vaccine, which has been very helpful in controlling other recent outbreaks, is ineffective. Thus, much of the control has been through using traditional methods, identifying cases and controls, and utilizing isolation and quarantine. We know that this approach is imperfect, particularly as case finding can be very difficult. In addition, there is evidence that people who are infected and recover might later transmit. However, this approach has worked in the past, and there are early indications that the number of cases have fallen. In addition, as we heard recently from Peter Marks, there are likely to be candidate vaccines for this illness in the not-too-distant future. So, Eric, I think that Ebola raises a couple of interesting contrasts to SARS-CoV-2. First, the issue of strain consistency over time. And I think that what we're dealing with in part with Ebola, be it Zaire, Sudan, or its closely related sibling, Marburg as well, is that they have already evolved over time and have spillover into humans. Then there's forward transmission in humans, but the viral genome does not change to the degree that we are seeing with SARS-CoV-2 that then escapes immunity. So I think that's an important element as we think about our vaccine development for Ebola Sudan or Ebola Zaire, as opposed to COVID, where the viral epitope that we are targeting is rapidly changing. I think another important consideration that we've learned from Ebola are the issue of sanctuary sites that you allude to. And we've seen that the vitreous in the eye or the testes and in semen may be places where in a recovered individual, virus can be recovered months later, if not longer, therefore potentially playing a role in initiating new transmission. And this may well have played a role in some of the transmission events in the 70s and 80s that were described. With SARS-CoV-2, it's not as clear that there are sanctuary sites such as the vitreous or the testes, but we have seen in individuals with profoundly weakened immune systems, prolonged viral infection and shedding with viral evolution with immunologic escape mutations suggesting that prolonged or persistent infection may play a role in ongoing transmission and viral evolution. So I think there are parallels here, although they are a bit different, that force us to think about our understanding of the virus, its persistence, and what type of countermeasures we have to develop to ensure that new outbreaks don't occur. Lindsay, I want to touch on a different sort of sanctuary than what you're speaking about, and that is the animal sanctuary for most of the diseases that we're talking about, which are zoonotic. RSV appears to be a human infection, but flu occurs in birds, mpox occurs in rodents, and Ebola probably in bats, although it's not entirely clear that's the reservoir. So when you brought up the idea of smallpox eradication, we could do that successfully because all disease was in humans. None of the diseases we're talking about right now are really eradicable. So there will continue to be spillover events, as you mentioned before, from the animal reservoirs for all of these. So we need to be prepared for those events rather than act proactively to try to eliminate disease. Finally, let's get to an outbreak that we haven't really discussed, cholera in Haiti. Haiti has suffered from both natural disasters and political and social upheaval recently, and that unfortunately has created the perfect environment for the spread of cholera. What's the situation now in Haiti? This is the second large outbreak of cholera in Haiti. The first one was in 2010, and it was massive. There were 800,000 cases following a catastrophic earthquake. In an effort to help, many international workers had come to Haiti, including those from countries where cholera is endemic. Subsequent investigations showed that the clone which caused the outbreak originated in South Asia and was very likely to have traveled with some of the UN peacekeepers. That outbreak resulted in almost 10,000 deaths. But cholera did recede, and in fact, there haven't been any new cases reported since 2019 until just now. Unfortunately, political chaos has returned to Haiti and has made the conditions right for more transmission and for higher levels of mortality. Transportation has been blocked in many areas 
meaning that it's been difficult or impossible to provide the supplies necessary to treat and prevent disease. In particular, there's been very little fuel, which is necessary to pump supplies of safe potable water. This, together with poor sanitation, has meant that cholera, which is a waterborne organism, can be easily transmitted. The blockades also mean that the patients can't get to healthcare facilities, and importantly, food distribution has been very limited. So cholera is occurring in the worst possible conditions with widespread hunger that will contribute to high mortality. Today, we published a report from a clinic in the capital, Port-au-Prince, where 10% of the children with cholera also have severe malnutrition. It's a terrible situation and is likely again to result in a high death rate. So where did this outbreak come from? Another report we published today shows that the strain causing the outbreak is remarkably similar to the strain that caused the previous outbreak. This suggests that the same strain has persisted in Haiti or nearby, either through subclinical infection or probably more likely in environmental reservoirs. Thus, we don't need new introductions of the pathogen to see large outbreaks. So I think, Eric and Steve, global outbreaks with cholera are ongoing in multiple jurisdictions around the world currently. And this is something we need to pay attention to. And I hope we've learned from the COVID outbreak and the other outbreaks that we're discussing is that there are many outbreaks going on that threaten health and that are rapidly moving between jurisdictions. We tremendously value the reports that we are able to publish from investigators who are able to improve our understanding of these outbreaks. This allows us to shine a light on what is going on that is threatening health everywhere in the world, that can threaten health everywhere in the world. As we think about cholera, you note, Eric, is a waterborne. This event highlights how quickly infectious diseases can spread when social collapse occurs. Simple, clean water and a sewer system prevents a lot of these diarrheal pathogens. It is tragic that there is a collapse of this kind of infrastructure, which then facilitates the emergence of these kinds of pathogens like cholera that can spread so rapidly and widely in a society causing incredible health consequence. What is also interesting and alluded to, although the data are still early from Haiti, is what is the role of immunity and why are children preferentially suffering? Is it because of the nature of their exposures or 10 years ago with the prior event? A substantial amount of the population was infected or vaccinated, and there was immunity established that may be waning, but still present. And we now have a new cadre of individuals, those under 10, who are cholera naive and therefore that much more vulnerable. Much needs to be learned to better define and understand this, but it does suggest that countermeasures like a cholera vaccine may play a role in assisting in the response as well as improving such basic infrastructure as clean water and sanitation. So there's a lot to be learned in this event scientifically. We already know what needs to be done to improve the conditions there. And hopefully we as a global community can respond appropriately to stop this outbreak, which is ongoing in Haiti, as well as the many other outbreaks going on elsewhere in the world. Very much like many of the pathogens that we've already discussed, Lindsay, the key to controlling this disease is preparedness. Again, there is a reservoir for this organism, for Vibrio cholerae, in the environment. In this case, it's not an animal reservoir, but the organism survives in seawater, on zooplankton like copepods, and it can stay around for a long time. Even more strikingly, there is ongoing evolution of Vibrios in the environmental reservoir. So there are new outbreak strains evolving all the time in areas where cholera is endemic, such as in South Asia. Because we can't eliminate that environmental reservoir, we are always going to have to contend with cholera in the places where there is a lot of cholera. And it is going to be important that we be ready ready with vaccines, ready with the countermeasures that can allow people to survive who have the infection. The treatment for cholera, as is discussed in an accompanying piece that we published today, is relatively straightforward. It's fluids, either IV fluids or oral rehydration, and care of these patients. 
But given poor nutrition, given lack of access to rehydration fluids, it can be impossible to save lives in a way that could be done easily if all of this were available. Eric, I think you're absolutely right. Preparedness is key and appropriate social infrastructure. And these are elements which we've developed in response to COVID for the management of SARS-CoV-2, but also for all the diseases we've been talking about. And we need to, as a community, just deploy them. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric.